Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Today's Tuesday topic, really talking about cardiac terminology, but today focusing on preload. So I love talking about preload. It's like all the jazz right now. Everybody talks about volume, volume responsiveness. How do we know if our patient needs volume? But the real focus is actually on preload. So I want to think about our definition of preload, and we're going to think about how we really apply that. But before we even start, it's always important when you come to the bedside of a critically ill patient, it doesn't really matter if they have catheters or lines because everybody who lives, everybody who lives, cats, dogs, you, me, your husband, your kids, we all have a cardiac output. And remember, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. And what we really care about, what the focus is for us today in terms of looking at what patients do is to actually determine whether their stroke volume is adequate. So the very first question is, does my patient have blood flow adequacy to meet metabolic demands? So we think about this in three separate categories. First of all, do they have good pump function? Now we evaluate pump function by echocardiogram, looking at your ejection fraction. We can use a POCUS point of care ultrasound and look at the cardiac contraction, look at the mobilization of the wall, and especially the septal wall, look at the diameter of the chamber. We can do all of that with a POCUS, but we can also use whatever method we have. That might be a flow track, or it could be a starling, to look at your stroke volume. And then the next question is, is my patient's intravascular volume, and really more important than intravascular, is, is my patient's intraarterial volume adequate for this patient to have an appropriate stroke volume. Typically, the way we're going to do this at assessing the volume is by looking at the difference between systole and diastole on the arterial pressure. That's called the pulse pressure. That also correlates with the stroke volume, but I'm measuring it now in the arteries and looking at the difference between systole and diastole. I'd like to see a difference of around 40 millimeters of mercury. That generally tells me that I have a good stroke volume and I have an adequate vascular volume. And then I'm going to think about something else that's really important. This is a point where we really include some of our preload measure, which will be our CVP, CVP re uh, referencing right atrial volume load and chamber stretch. That's, that's actually the end point of a driving pressure. The driving pressure is the mean arterial pressure minus the CVP. And for this to be effective, for my patient to have good blood flow dynamic, for them to have a normal delivery of oxygen for their metabolic demands, the difference of MAP minus CVP should be 55 or greater. So if I have a patient with a CVP of 20 and an MAP of 60, I don't have adequate driving pressure. I've now got to figure out, can I get CVP down and can I get MAP up? So actually a very similar concept to cerebral perfusion pressure, but now we're talking about systemic perfusion pressure. So that's at first and important when I'm coming to the bedside, these are things that I'm gonna ask. I wanna remind you that the whole role of mean arterial pressure, that's what you're seeing here, is to actually push the blood through the capillaries where they deoxygenate, where oxygen is delivered to the cells and to ultimately end up in the right atria. So this is why we talk about drive pressure and what we think about when we talk about preload, that you have to have an, an adequate pressure in the mean artery pressure that drives the blood flow all the way through the vasculature, all the way back to the right atrium. Sometimes uh, people don't really talk about this much at the bedside, but it's pretty easy. MAP minus CVP should be greater than 55 if you want to have adequate blood flow. And that's really what this is all about. It's not really about independent measures that you're charting in EPIC, so you fulfilled your EPIC charting criteria. It really is about how do I actually assure that my patient has good blood flow. So we should always know, we should always know, strive to know, strive to understand if possible, left ventricular function and right ventricular function. We're gonna look at left ventricular function, the systemic arteries. We look at right ventricular function in the pulmonary artery. If you don't have a PA catheter, you really can't look at right-sided function. You can only look at left-sided function. You look at that in the systemic arteries. You wanna remember the effects of breathing, whether it's spontaneous breathing or positive pressure breathing, that actually changes the dynamic of blood volume to the heart and therefore affects your blood flow. And then 
what we're really going to focus on for today, because I'm going to have a series, probably a four week series where I look at each one of these components. But for today, what we're going to focus on really is preload and preload responsiveness. Lots of terminology that you're fluid, fluid responsiveness, preload, preload responsiveness, really important in terms of how we look at our patients. So again, we go back and we remind ourselves about the cardiac terms is cardiac output is the volume of blood that is pumped per minute that's ejected by the ventricle over a minute's period of time. Now that's great because it looks at the blood flow average over a minute, but really importantly, and what's really important to measure about ventricular effectiveness is your stroke volume. So I am not in favor of having the cardiac output be the most prominent thing in your monitoring. I feel like stroke volume should be the most prominent thing. Cardiac output expressed in liters per minute, normally around four to eight liters a minute, and the average is around five liters. Stroke volume is normally the same as your heart rate, 60 to 100. Stroke volume is the amount of volume ejected with each contraction, with each beat of the heart. And stroke volume actually indicates ventricular effectiveness. So if I have a methodology for looking at stroke volume, for me, it would be FlowTrack, would also be Starling. You might use ClearSight. You might not have anything. All you have is an A-line, then that's your pulse pressure, systole minus diastole, that's okay. Whatever it is that you can use, you wanna remember that that is measuring ventricular effectiveness. Now, ventricular effectiveness means if I give you volume, your stroke volume should increase. That's really simple. Don't make it more complicated. It doesn't need to be complicated. If I give you volume and your ventricle is effective, your stroke volume should increase when I give you volume. So I have to have a way to look at that stroke volume. It's not good enough just to talk about blood pressure, but you could say systolic pressure, pulse pressure, systole minus diastole, that should be around 40 millimeters of mercury or more, okay? Stroke volume, 60 to 100, measured by flow track or Starling or ClearSight, doesn't matter. You need to have an endpoint because when I give you volume, the only good volume that you ever get is the volume that gets ejected by the ventricle. So that's a really important concept. Stroke volume in the truest of terms is the volume that fills the ventricle at the end of filling, that's end diastolic, minus the volume that is left in the ventricle at the end of systole. So filling volume minus remaining volume after contraction. And this is where we talk about preload. We talk about some other things as well. Preload is both a measure of the volume in the ventricle and very, very importantly, don't forget ventricular, <clears throat> ventricular compliance or what we would call ventricular stretch. Ventricular volume, ventricular stretch. So when I talk about preload pressure, which is what we measure, we don't measure preload volume, we measure preload pressure. When we talk about preload pressure, it is affected both by the volume in the ventricle and the ventricular compliance or ventricular stretch. Contractility is a measure of the chamber contraction or of the recoil of our fibers that generates pressure and the amount of pressure that needs to be generated by contraction is determined by the tension or pressure required to open the valve and eject volume. So actually, whatever your systolic pressure is in your arteries and the patency of your aortic valve for the left heart the pressure in your pulmonary arteries and the patency of the pulmonic valve for your right heart, my contraction has to be able to overcome that. So my heart fills with volume and it stretches preload. It recoils, generating a high pressure contractility. And the amount of pressure that is required by the contraction is what is designed to overcome the resistance in the arteries and at the valve preload afterload contractility. Pretty straightforward, doesn't need to be complex. We always remind ourselves the only way we can assume contractility, because we can never measure it, is by ejection fraction or stroke volume evaluation. And again, however you measure stroke volume, that's cool. Whatever it is that you're using, you just got to use it and you've got to be prepared to use it. And remember that contractility is about that intrinsic ability of the myofibrils to slide across each other, shorten, making the inside chamber smaller. And when you make the chamber smaller, the pressure goes up. The amount of pressure you have to generate is dependent on the valve and the arteries leaving the ventricle. So this is all very interrelated and relatively uh, intimate with each other. Then we think about preload. So remember what I said, preload is muscle stretch or length prior to contraction. 
So it depends on the volume that fills the ventricle. That's known as end diastolic volume, EDV, or ventricular filling. But I can't measure your volume. I can't measure your volume. So what I measure is right atrial pressure by CVP, left atrial pressure by pulmonary capillary wedge or PAD using a PA catheter. I want to make sure you appreciate CVP is a right heart measure. It's not a left heart measure. Never was, never will be. World without end. Amen, brother. It is a right atrial pressure measure, CVP. Wedge or PAD is about the left atrial pressure, and the role of the atria is to fill the ventricle. If the ventricle is stiff and non-compliant, then the atrial pressure is going to go up. If the valve between the atria and the ventricle is stiff or stenosed, then the atrial pressure is going to go up. If the valve is regurgitating, then the atrial pressure is going to go up. So the problem for us with CVP is we always wanted CVP to be a volume measure. It was never a volume measure. And it is profoundly impacted by ventricular stretch, the compliance of the chamber being filled, and the amount of volume that goes into the ventricle. So again, I'm really focusing, although I'll mention wedge and PAD, I'm really focusing on CVP as an indicator of right-sided filling looking at the stretch of the ventricle and the volume that fills the ventricle, the venous return to the ventricle that fills the ventricle, loads the ventricle, the ventricle then moves that volume out of the ventricle into the vessels leaving it. And then for just a little final word about afterload, remembering that afterload is the tension or the pressure that must be developed by the ventricle that's required to open our valve and overcome the resistance to the blood flow. And we're gonna assume this by systemic pressure and pulmonary pressure. Afterload for the left ventricle is determined by the patency of the aortic valve and the aortic systolic pressure. Afterload for the right ventricle is determined by the pulmonic valve and the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Not double pressure, just one pressure. Okay, so for you at your bedside, right? You want to have a way to evaluate preload. And what you're using is a pressure number. Okay, that's what you use, CVP wedge pressure or PAD, CVP for the right atria, which is about the right ventricle, wedge pressure or PAD for the left atria, atria, which is about the left ventricle. And what we're going to remind ourselves about here is that we're never going to measure that volume. We always measure the pressure, okay? And then we also have to evaluate ventricular efficiency. You can't do one without the other. That is so inadequate and it's really an incorrect way to manage patients. You have to be able to say, what is my preload or my filling pressure and how well is my ventricle responding? Now that's what gives us what we call the Frank Starling curve. So if we're looking at this right here, this is just a hand-drawn Frank Starling curve and diastolic volume, we're not measuring that, so we're measuring pressure and ventricular performance, we're not measuring that, we measure stroke volume. So in the basic sense, CVP to stroke volume, CVP to stroke volume, lots of things affect that end diastolic volume or end diastolic pressure, which has nothing to do with volume. If you take a look at this, venous tone, uh, compliance, right? The, uh, the, the relationship of the thorax to the heart, body positioning, total blood volume, the only volume measure you heard there, uh, atrial contribution or atrial contraction, and the pumping action of the skeletal muscles. Lots of things affect this, not just do you have volume or not? That's never the answer. CVP is always an indicator of volume and compliance. And that's what's gonna be really important for us to appreciate. So you'll see here, what the what I said, this is all about your cardiac output, okay? So as your venous return decreases, okay? And that's what we're looking at, your venous return, your right atrial pressure increases, I'm so sorry, as your right atrial pressure increases, your venous return decreases because it's hard for volume to move from the vein into the atria. If the right ventricle is stiff and the right atria can't empty, then I get a lot of volume in my veins, a lot of volumes in the extravascular space. And what I can see in relationship to that is that the cardiac output is going to go down. So as my CVP goes up, my cardiac output may go down. And that's telling me not necessarily that I don't have volume or that I do, but that I have to consider that I may have loss of compliance. So in pursuit of volume, one of the first things that we talk about that's really, really important because it can be applied anywhere. It doesn't require any special um, 
catheters or any special materials other than a point of care ultrasound. So uh, in, in my hospital here at Grady, uh, in the trauma surgical unit, all of the trauma surgeons are all about POCUS. In the ED, they're getting to be all about POCUS and really probably in the medical ICU as well, talking a lot about POCUS, just point of care ultrasound. They use a point of care ultrasound with the ultrasound wand on the veins, on the lungs, and on the ventricle. And that's going to tell us a lot about whether or not our patient has adequate volume and has an adequate preload. So this is really, really important. Now we're gonna to add to that chest X-ray. We're gonna look at your neck veins. We'll look at your systolic blood pressure. Are you making urine or not? Are you gaining weight? If you're gaining weight, you're not making urine. Your systolic blood pressure is dropping. Your neck veins are distended. You got volume, but here's the thing. It doesn't necessarily mean your volume overloaded. It just may mean you've lost ventricular compliance. That's why monitoring preload pressure is so important because we're gonna use that in conjunction with other information to tell us whether our patient actually needs diuresis or whether they might need an inotrope. And that's really the point of your preload pressure. Okay, so you can see here, this is a patient who's sitting straight up and you can see how distended her neck veins are. We're pretty sure she's got volume, but she's hypotensive and she's not making urine. So she has volume, it's in the veins, her preload pressure and her preload volume are high, but she's not moving that volume into the systemic arteries. She's hypotensive. She's not making urine. And our first goal would be with somebody like this, we're probably going to try a diuretic. And then we're probably going to add in an inotrope for this patient to try to actually make the ventricle more functional and more effective and working more appropriately. This patient presents with difficulty in breathing. She's got tachycardia. Her weight's up six kilograms. She can't walk the same distance as she walked last week, and she can't get her feet into her shoes. She's actually in heart failure. She has a high preload pressure, but her blood pressure being low, you're a little uncomfortable giving her a diuretic. You might do it anyway. You're going to monitor really carefully. You might give her a diuretic and start her on a low-dose vasopressor, but ultimately what she is probably going to need is an inotrope. And again, that's how we're going to use our preload pre measures to actually evaluate our patient more effectively. This is a picture of a patient who comes into the ECC with acute fulminant chest pain. The patient's having a STEMI. And after that STEMI, the patient, of course, exhibits heart failure. So that's really why, again, we use preload measures. Preload measures can tell me that I have heart failure. They don't really, preload pressure measures don't tell me whether your problem is too much fluid or too bad of a heart. I can't get that from a preload pressure measure. I have to correlate preload pressure to stroke volume. Preload pressure is up, stroke volume is down, you got a bad heart. You need an inotrope. Stroke volume is down, preload pressure is down, you need volume. It's pretty straightforward. Not always that easy, easy to talk about, not so easy to apply, but you can see here, this patient has a high preload pressure. CVP is 18, 19, 20, but the stroke volume, which should be 60 to 100, is 25. Okay, now that patient's got bad blood pressure, they're hypotensive, but if you put a vasopressor on them, you're just gonna make their heart dysfunction worse. So you really want to be able to make these correlations simply with whatever it is that you have at the bedside to apply to the patient. Now we take a look further at this patient with that EKG, with that chest X-ray. Chest X-ray shows, of course, bilateral pulmonary edema. Patient's troponin is 34,000. The BNP is 800, so patient's in heart failure. She has hypoxia at the cellular level. She's got an elevated lactate level. Got some renal failure, creatinine is 3.1. Her baseline creatinine was 1.0. Now it's three times that, her BUN is 30. And she has a mild to uh, moderate metabolic acidosis. Certainly has some failure of oxygenation. She has a base deficit of negative 4.5, but she's compensating by breathing fast and blowing off CO2. So she has a mild metabolic acidosis, mild to moderate metabolic acidosis. She's got heart failure. She's got distended neck veins, wet lungs, hypotension, no urine output, renal failure, and she's gaining weight. What are you going to do? Normally what we do is we put the patient on a vasopressor and then we might add a diuretic and that's okay because that's what you might do initially. You don't want the patient to die. You don't want her to have an infarct. You're trying to help her. You're trying to do the right thing, but then you got to step back and say, what's the real problem here? Preload pressure up, stroke volume down, patient probably needs an inotrope. Okay.
So this is just another patient in heart failure who presents with these same kinds of conditions. And this is the echocardiogram, which shows you that the chamber is really, really large. So the chamber is dilated, filled with volume, probably not very compliant, relatively stiff. So that brings us really to preload and preload responsiveness. I'm just gonna say this as simply as I can. So people use all sorts of terms. They say stroke volume variation, they'll say fluid responsive, fluid refractory, preload responsive, preload refractory. All I'm saying to you is this. If I give my patient volume and their ventricle is efficient, the stroke volume should go up. If I'm not monitoring the stroke volume and I'm just looking at a pressure or my patient has a central line, I'm not even monitoring the pressure. How do I have any idea what I'm doing? So what I wanna look at is if I'm putting volume into the ventricle and the CVP goes up or the wedge goes up, stroke volume must also go up. If CVP or wedge pressure go up but stroke volume doesn't, your ventricle is inefficient. Don't give volume, give inotrope. Volume in, stroke volume goes up, patient needed volume. Volume in, CVP and wedge pressure go up but stroke volume does not, patient needs an inotrope. And it's pretty straightforward. So we use a lot of, I mean, I'm trying to make it really simple. It's obviously not quite this simple, but it is really important to remember that everything you do, when you give volume, when you give inotrope, you're testing the efficiency of the ventricle. And the preload pressure is a guide, but it's not an absolute. Because even if your patient's pressure is high, if they respond to volume and their stroke volume goes up, they need more volume and the preload pressure is probably representative of a loss of ventricular compliance, which is quite worrisome. Okay, so I feel like what we have to do and how we as bedside nurses have to do is if we have a central line, we should always be monitoring the CVP. Now, when we bring to our docs, oh, your CVP is 12 or your CVP is 18 or your CVP is 20, typically your docs or your APPs will say, well, you know, CVP is not a volume measure. We don't use CVP anymore to measure volume. And they are absolutely right. We don't use CVP to measure volume. It never was a volume measure. It's always a reflection of the compliance of the ventricle and the volume that fills the ventricle. And what we always forget is we wanna use CVP just to tell us about volume, but we forget it's really most significantly affected by a change in ventricular compliance. So no manipulation of CVP, giving volume, giving diuretics, starting an inotrope, putting a patient on vasopressor, no manipulation of CVP should be performed without evaluating the effect on your stroke volume. So again, Maybe you have a flow track, maybe you have a clear site, maybe you have a starling, maybe you have a focus, maybe you have, you know, intraesophageal ultrasound to monitor your left ventricular ejection. But basically, this is what I'm going to say. If my CVP responds to volume, so should my systolic pressure. My CVP responds to volume, so should my pulse pressure, systole minus diastole. My CVP responds to volume, so should my stroke volume. If I look at CVP in isolation, I'm doing my patient a terrible disservice. It's not meaningful, it's not helpful, it won't help drive treatment and it won't improve the outcome for the patient. And that's why most people say now don't monitor the CVP because they historically were using CVP to tell them about volume and it's not a volume measure, it's a pressure measure. Okay, so you know, I, I use these slides a lot. I just remind you that Patients come to us, they have inadequate volume. Typically what we're gonna say is any CVP less than 10, any CVP less than 10, your patient needs volume, period. Any CVP less than 10, your patient needs volume. It's when the CVP that is greater than 10 becomes more difficult for us. So my patient bled out on the street, their CVP is two or four, right? They have DI, diabetes insipidus. They've lost a lot of fluid. They've been in DK, their CVP is really low. They need volume. We don't even have to think about volume and stroke volume, at least initially. It's when the CVP gets above 10 that we have to say, okay, now I have to correlate the volume that I'm giving the patient and the rise in the central venous pressure to the increase in stroke volume. So it's pretty straightforward. CVP less than 10, typically you need volume. CVP higher than 10, I now need to compare CVP to stroke volume and see how the patient responds to the volume that I give them. That's what preload responsiveness is. So basically um, with true hypovolemia, filling pressure, CVP will be down and stroke volume will be down. 
When I give you volume, your CVP starts to come up, your stroke volume comes up, I know I've done the right thing. I'm going to give you more volume. Your filling pressure CVP comes up, your stroke volume comes up. I've done the right thing. I give you more volume. Your CVP comes up, but your stroke volume stays the same or goes down. I need to stop. You don't need volume anymore. Volume is not the right answer. For hypovolemia, filling pressure is down, stroke volume down, and I'm going to monitor my patient's response so I know when to stop giving volume. I don't just give volume because I like it. I don't just give volume because I have it. I give volume because the patient needs it and they can respond to it. Okay. If you have an inadequate heart, those are things like inadequate cardiac contractile state, uh, looking at whether the patient has a really rapid heart rate and how much work the ventricle is doing is having to overcome systemic hypertension or pulmonary hypertension, a lot of work, and you lose really compliance of the ventricle. As you lose compliance of the ventricle, your filling pressure, your CVP is going to go up, but your stroke volume goes down. When CVP is up and stroke volume is down, the problem is the heart. It's not your vessels. It's not that you need vasopressors. You need to really focus on the cardiac mechanism. Is contractility appropriate? Do I have ischemia? Do I have hypertrophy? Do I have valvular dysfunction? Filling pressure up, CVP up, stroke volume down. That really indicates to us that we have cardiac failure. And that's going to be a really important concept. And then the last thing is in a whole separate category, whole separate category, right? Inadequate vascular tone where you have dilated vessels. You're septic, you're anaphylactic, you're acidotic, your vessels are dilated and you can no longer constrict appropriately. So you're, you're, as long as your heart is working and your heart can work and compensate, and that may be for two hours, that might be for two days, it might be for five minutes. As long as you have cardiac compensation, when the vessels are dilated, your filling pressure, most particularly here, talking about CVP, pre-low pressure, goes down, but your stroke volume goes up. So you give volume, you try to get that filling pressure up a little bit, and the stroke volume should keep going up. When you get to the point that your filling pressure CVP has uh, does not equate to an increase in stroke volume, it's time to stop giving your patient volume. It's pretty straightforward. If I give you volume, you better mobilize it. If I give you volume, you better mobilize it. You need to have a response. That response is only a 10% response, by the way. It's not a huge response. So if my, if my stroke volume was 40, that just means I increased my stroke volume by four millimeters of mercury or four milliliters per beat, sorry, four milliliters. So that's a really important concept. So I wanna remind you that for most of us, the preload pressure that we measure is CVP. CVP was never, ever, ever, can't be today, wasn't 10 years ago, wasn't 30 years ago, won't be in 20 years either. It was never a volume number. It was always a pressure. So we monitor preload pressure. Even when we're looking at neck vein compliance, we are monitoring preload pressure. That's really, really important because you may have engorged veins and a stiff heart, but you may be arterially hypovolemic. And the decision to do volume or inotrope and or vasopressors is a really significant one. And when we're at the bedside, we're not really evaluating did the volume that filled the ventricle, my preload volume that filled my ventricle get ejected outwards, and we're reacting just to hypotension and other things like that, it may be doing our patient a disservice. The only real volume number that we measure at the bedside is stroke volume. That's a real volume measure, and it's affected by filling, contractility, and resistance. So again, we always say, come back and talk about Frank Starling mechanism, and we remind ourselves that through the eyes of Frank Starling, patients should actually be able to stretch their myocardium when you give volume. So as you give volume and you're bringing up the CVP, they should have an increase, a shift to what we call the shift to the left, increasing their stroke volume. When you add a ninotrope, that may actually make the CVP go up because the heart rate might go up, but they should also have an increase in stroke volume. If I give you volume, I'm not really worried about whether your CVP is 10, 12, 15, or 17. If you don't have an adequate stroke volume, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a small volume challenge, 250 cc's, and I'm going to see, do you increase your stroke volume? If I give you volume and you don't increase your stroke volume, I'm going to say the CVP that I'm using here is reflecting more a loss of compliance and less the patient's volume status. And that's what's really important about preload and preload responsiveness is we have to appreciate, we can look at neck veins, 
We can look at CVP. We can look at wedge pressure. We can look at PAD. But these tools are profoundly affected by a change in ventricular compliance. So my goal, what my effort is, is to actually help us to appreciate that pressure is not volume. Systolic pressure is not volume. Diastolic pressure is not volume. CVP pressure is not volume. PAD, wedge pressure, they're not volume. They are measures that tell us about the relationship of volume to compliance. If my ventricle is compliant, it can handle a lot of volume. If my ventricle is non-compliant, it can handle much volume. If my arteries are dilated, we can put a lot of volume in there, but we're probably not going to generate good pressure. As I vasoconstrict your arteries, I now have changed your compliance, but I may have also reduced your volume. So what I really want to do in this introduction for preload and preload responsiveness is to actually assure that we are looking at pressure and reminding ourselves that it's a surrogate and a weak one for sure. A surrogate measure for volume and compliance and never approach preload numbers or uh, pressure numbers as the endpoint of everything that you do, but that you expand your ideas to think about all pressure is about volume and compliance. Every patient deserves a volume test. If I give you volume and your preload pressure stays the same or goes up, but your stroke volume goes up, you are volume responsive, you are preload responsive. If I give you volume and your CVP stays the same, and your stroke volume goes down, you are not preload responsive. If I give you volume and your CVP stays the same and your stroke volume stays the same, that's kind of uncertain. So I might give you another volume because I want to, I would like to make your CVP go up or I would like to make your stroke volume go up. I don't want to see that neither one of them respond. They have to respond. And that's really what I want. I give patients volume as part of a diagnostic test. Can they handle the volume I give them and can they eject it? So what I really wanted to talk about here today is that CVP is really meaningful and it's really valuable, but not in the historic way that we traditionally have used it. Never was a volume measure, isn't a volume measure now, but it does give us an eye on the prize of volume and compliance of the right ventricle. Most of us are using the right ventricle to reflect the left ventricle. But what we always want to remember is no evaluation is complete with CVP alone as a preload measure. You have to look at the preload measure and the relationship of stroke volume responsiveness. So for today, that ends the talk on preload and preload responsiveness. Thank you so much for joining in for Tuesday topic. And I hope I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll be reviewing a case of sickle cell, DKA, pancreatitis, and hypertriglyceridemia. Really interesting case, a lot of good information, and hopefully you'll be able to join me tomorrow. Next week, there will not be Tuesday or Wednesday talks. This Christmas week and going into New Year's, I'm going to be taking a break. I'm going to have some voice rest, but I'm very grateful that you joined here today. Bye-bye for now. Thank you so very much.